listening to the international hit show, The Baby Names Podcast. And here are your hosts, the Moss Sisters. I'm Jennifer Moss. And I'm Mallory Moss Katz. And we're the founders of babynames.com. And we're sisters too. Hooray! So our first segment is interesting names we found since the last episode, and mine is pretty cool, Praxitike. Now that's spelled P-R-A-X-I-D-I-K-E. Oi. I found it as a character name on the TV show, The Expanse. He's male, and they call him Prax for short. So I was thinking, is that a real name? It's so cool. And I went and looked it up. And it is a real name. It happens to be the name of a Greek goddess of vengeance and punishment, which is ironically opposite of his character on The Expanse, but I don't want to give any spoilers away. Praxitike is also the name of one of Jupiter's moons, and it was discovered fairly recently in 2000 by a team of scientists at the University of Hawaii. And in Greek, the name literally translates to action of judgment, praxis and decay. So praxitike, ladies and gentlemen. Jennifer, not everyone is going to name their babies after science fiction characters from TV. In fact, I hope very few people do. Why? These are awesome <laughs> names. Praxitike. Hmm, I really hope not. I know a Telemachus. Didn't you know a Telemachus? I have never known Telemachus. Telemachus. <laughs> Telemachus. Either one I have never known. They're awesome ancient Greek names. Anyway. <laughs> well, you know, I hear a lot of interesting baby names every week, but I can't talk of them. And the reason is because they're my patient's children. Uh, yeah. I guess they have the coolest name ideas. <laughs> so what I is you folks to send me interesting baby names at podcast at babynames.com. Okay. Send her some names, you guys. She's running out. I am. So the topic of this episode is baby naming, influencer culture, and personal branding. In this day and age of the global society, internet, YouTubers, and influencers, parents feel they have an extra layer of stress when naming their babies. How will the name be perceived? Can I get the domain name? Does someone already have the domain name? And if so, what's on it? And there are so many things to think about now. Yeah, definitely. I remember when I was working at a dot com in the early days, one of the programmers ran around telling everybody to register their name domain. Like that was his mission for some reason. He said, you'll thank me later. So I went and registered jennifermoss.com. And you know what? I am so glad I did because it wasn't until the internet was in full swing publicly with social media, Wikipedia and all that, that I realized just how many Jennifer Mosses were out there, even a famous British actress. And a nudist. And, and a nudie activist, too. <laughs> so did you register Miranda's name? I did. And I held on to it for a lot of years. And when she was 18, I was like, if you want it, you're going to have to pay for it now. And she was like, nah, and she let it go. She doesn't have that name anymore anyway, so it's a moot point. Did you register your name? Yep, I'm registered, including my maiden name and my name now. Good. And so is my business, of course. In right? fact, I made sure that my businesses.com was available before I even named my business. You really have to do that nowadays. Well, that brings us to our conversation with Laurel Sutton. You know, personal branding is not a new thing, but in the influencer generation, it's something that parents should think about when naming their baby. I invited Laurel Sutton on the show to speak with us about this topic. Laurel is the co-founder of Catchword, one of the world's leading naming firms, and that's naming things like products, services, and companies. She currently runs Sutton Strategy, consulting in linguistic analysis, naming, marketing, and expert testimony in court on naming and branding. She has both a bachelor's and master's degree in linguistics and is currently the vice president of the American Name Society, where we met. Welcome, Laurel, to the Baby Names podcast. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. Sure. So when did you first know that you were a name nerd? You know, it was not a thing for me that 
uh, like it was not a dream that I had from childhood. I got into linguistics because I started life as an English major and was very quickly bored by it. But at the program that I was in, they required us to take some linguistics classes in addition to the regular English literature classes. And I just loved it. I thought it was the most amazing thing to look at language and pull it apart and analyze the sounds and the contexts and the way people use it. It just was so fascinating to me. So I moved out to California to do my master's at Berkeley in linguistics. And at some point, I, I just got burnt out on graduate school. And a friend of mine worked for another naming firm and said, well, if you want to take a break, I think you would like doing naming. And at that point, I really didn't know that naming existed as a career like most people then. So this is 1998, basically. And, you know, it was early days for the naming biz. And I, I went and I worked at this job and it was amazing. It combined my knowledge from linguistics plus just kind of the free spirit and entrepreneurial attitude that really appealed to me. And at, it was at that point that I became a naming nerd, really. So for listeners that have never named a company or a product, what are all the things you have to consider? Oh, it's so complicated now. I, I think many people think that it's like it was in Mad Men, right. that you go to a bar and you have some martinis and you write some names down on a napkin and you go, hey, we've done it, aren't we great? Because that uh, names now need to be available, legally available in different spheres. It's far more complicated than it used to be. So you need to get a trademark for your name and the trademark can be in the United States only, but it can also be global. You can register a trademark in just about every country of the world. And to find a name that's not already been trademarked for the thing that you want to trademark it for is quite difficult. There's also the concern about getting a domain name. If it's a company, for example, you isn't that like one of the first things you'd want to check? A, a lot of people want the exact.com, despite the fact that there are now many, many other domain extensions that you can have. .com is still the one that people want because it's the default and everybody wants to have it. So finding either an available domain or one that you can purchase or being able to manipulate the domain name in some way so that it becomes available, you know, by adding words before it or after it is an incredibly important thing. And then you also want to have a name that is resonant with your target audience that means something to your company. You don't just want to pick an arbitrary word because then it will have no tie back to your brand or your mission or, or what it is that you do. So it's a huge number of circles in that Venn diagram to find the sweet spot that's right in the middle for a name that's both appropriate and available. And that's why people hire naming companies because it's really hard to do that on your own. It is. I've named several companies on my own, and it's really hard. Now, one of the services you provide is researching pronounceability, negative meaning in international languages, just like, you know, that urban legend of the Chevy Nova from the 60s and 70s. And it, the legend was it didn't sell in Mexico because Nova literally meant doesn't go or doesn't run. So how can you possibly run a name through all the languages in the world? And is that necessary? It's not necessary to do every language. What I typically tell clients is for them to figure out where they're going to do business. So if they're an American company, but Asia is a huge market for them, like many electronics manufacturers, I would say, let's look at the major languages in Asia. So it, it really depends on who your target audience is. For companies that are launching a brand globally, as many companies do these days, there's probably a list of, you know, 20 or 25 languages that are crucial. I'm really glad you mentioned that the Nova thing is an urban legend because it totally didn't happen. Okay. <laughs> there are lots of examples of names that did mean something bad and got pulled, but that particular one, I, I'm fascinated by it because it, it has gone on for so long and people still believe it as if it's a true thing. And I think there, there's something to it that appeals to people's sense of, wow, look at this. Even big companies can make these basic mistakes, you know, kind of seeing big, right. powerful companies fall on their faces. But the truth is that, no, it always sold well. And I think they still sell Chevy Novas down in Latin America and the biggest oil company in Venezuela was also called Nova. Like Spanish people, Spanish speaking people know what Nova means. Now, because of the internet, we now live in a super global culture. And I know globalization is important in product naming, but do you think it's important in baby naming too? 
That's a really good question. I think this brings in the concept of cultural appropriation, right? So if you're going to give your kid a name that's drawn from another culture, maybe think twice about doing that if that's not your culture. You know, if, if you're a kind of standard issue white person and you see a name from some other culture that you're not from, it can really become, it can seem quite insensitive for you to just take something and not understand the meaning or the history or the resonance around a certain name. And you might be picking something that you think is arbitrary, but actually is a, a real name from some other culture or some other language. So you need to do research on any name before you choose it for your kid to make sure that your, you know, your child is going to grow up with a name that, well, people can pronounce for one thing. It's not going to constantly get right. misspelled and that doesn't mean something to another culture that, because as you say, we live in a global society now, is going to get them or you in trouble at some point down the line. Uh, appropriation is something to think about, definitely. So we had a whole episode on brand names as baby names, and I do want to cover that too, because people do tend to lean towards like, and, and I think Tiffany is a good example, Bentley, they seem to go for like the real high end brand names, thinking that might almost brand their baby. What do you think about that? You know, it's it's an option. You can certainly do that. I am sure that some of those names, well, let's take um, Mercedes as an example. That name for the brand of car was because the guy named it after his daughter, because that's an actual given name. Oh, there so, you go. <laughs> yeah. So, so it came from someone's name. And if you want to name your kid Mercedes, obviously, it, you know that it's this huge international car brand, but also it started as a personal name. And I think that's probably the case with some of the other brands. I, I don't know about Bentley for sure, but it probably was a family name. So right. like with anything that's sort of uh, au courant, it might seem really dated in time. So that's something that you want to think about. Exactly. Like Tiffany. I think Tiffany kind of conjures up the 80s. Well, probably especially because of the pop star, but yeah. Yeah. So it, it it's a consideration, you know, it's that Venn diagram again, you have to think, is this name going to last? Is it going to seem really trendy? Um, is it going to be the case that uh, when my kid is in uh, elementary school and the teacher says, um, I'm, I'm going to call roll now, and then they say Jack, and all the kids in class are named Jack, <laughs> because that was the trend, you know, oh, we have 27 Jacks in the class, okay. Now, we are in the blogging and influencer culture, and a lot of the millennials, including my daughter, are influencers. And I think we're encouraged now to create what's called personal brands. Mm -hmm. What does a personal brand mean to you, and how does somebody achieve that? <laughs> It's so interesting, isn't it, that people have brands? I think it, it's something that people have been doing for a long time, but it wasn't identified in the same way that we identify company brands or product brands. You know, it was more about a reputation. So maybe that's a synonym for people is reputation. But but brand now extends, as you say, to influencers and, and different spheres it, it is a reputation. It's what you stand for, and that can mean um, – morally or ethically or just the things that you enjoy or the things that you happen to be knowledgeable about. And it can extend to the way you look, the way you dress, the way you speak. You know, if we want to pick some people, uh, famous people, not just influencers, but I think Steve Jobs is a good example, right? He, he was a dude with a strong brand and he knew that. And his brand was all about being the lone genius. Right. And he always dressed exactly the same, right? He wore those black turtlenecks and he, he would get up and he always had the, oh, and one more thing when they would do the Apple announcement. And that's when they dropped the bomb about the big thing. And reading about him later on, you see that all of the things he did in his public appearances were very intentionally done to build this mystique around him and this brand. Well, I was talking to my daughter because she just recently got married in the last year. And I said, how is that going to affect your brand? And she said that it didn't really affect her brand, although she did go and look at her SEO and her, you know, her search queries and everything. But her brand is tied to her site name, which is Slashed Beauty. And I said, but, you know, there's another 
um, very popular blogger called Hannah Hart, you might have heard of her, where she actually used her name in her branding. Her website is hannahhart.org. She uses the word heart in um, like her TV show name and everything. So I said, do you think if Hannah got married, if she would change her name? And she goes, no, that's totally different because she's actually using her name and her brand. So do you think that parents should think about this when naming their baby? And like, what is the least thing they should do? Should they look up and see that they can get all the social names or, <laughs> or is it just like oh too much to consider at that point in time. I think that's a little much. I mean, think about it, right? If kids are being born now, what is the social media sphere going to be like in 20 years? We, we don't know. We have absolutely no idea. So I, I think, you know, basing naming choices now on what's happening now is a little short-sighted because we just don't know. Right. And honestly, you know, how many kids are going to grow up to really have a brand that's directly tied to their real name? Because so many people change their their name or come up with, you know, some kind of online name or online brand. I think that is more the norm than people using their actual real names. So do you think having an unusual name like Benedict Cumberbatch or Barack Obama contributes <laughs> to it being memorable? Oh, it absolutely does. I mean, it, it just adds a whole nother layer to your brand and it makes people really interested. Benedict Cumberbatch is interesting because I don't think his name is that unusual in the sort of posh English circles that he's from. You know, he, he's like a rich white boy from England. And, and I think right. a lot of people have names that are like that. So in his peer group, his name is not unusual. To Americans, it's really unusual and has been the cause of many hilarious puns on it. I think my favorite one is um, Burger King chicken fries. You know? <laughs> As long as you get those first two letters and then the kind of the flow of the the stresses and the syllables, it works really well. So, but I yeah. think he uses that too. Like he does. He makes yeah. fun of his own name and that's part of his brand. Exactly. Yeah. So if he had jumped all over that and been like, don't make fun of my name, people would have seen him as, you know, humorless and not relatable. But he, he leaned into that pretty strongly. And I think anybody who has an unusual name needs to accept the fact that some people are going to find it hard to say or, or they're going to object to it because it's, I'm using air quotes here, weird. That's just the reality. You have to deal with that. And again, like you said, it's cultural. It mm -hmm. depends, you know, what culture you're in. In the U.S., that's an unusual name. Mm -hmm. And we keep getting it wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but so we're used to Benjamin rather than Benedict. Right, right. So one of your services, and I'm fascinated with this, is doing expert naming testimony in court. And there have been legal cases that have involved personal names. I follow those. For example, Mariah Carey filed suit against an adult film actress, Mary Carey, whose birth name was Mary Ellen Cook, in 2006, when Mary filed a trademark for her name. And I guess Mary was also trying to be a singer, so that was part of the contention. But Mariah won. <laughs> and what are your thoughts on something like that, trademarking your own personal name? That's such an interesting area. The way trademark law works is you can't trademark your name for you. Like you as a person, Jennifer Moss, you couldn't just go to the trademark office and say, I'm filing a trademark for me because I'm a human. Because you can't trademark things that are not goods or services. So trademark law is based on identifying goods and services for consumers. That's the whole purpose of trade. That's why they're called trademarks, right? Because it's for right. a trade. It's a trade. Yeah. yeah. So if you want to trademark your personal name, it has to be for something that has your name on it. So a line of t-shirts, a, a recording effort, a movie. Um, you can't trademark book titles, but you can trademark, say, movie titles if you're selling merchandise that goes along with it. So it has to be something that you're selling to consumers. And presumably that's what that trademark was about, that Mary Carey was trying to sell records or something where her name or t-shirts that was going to have her name on it, or even a website. Maybe she was trying to do marycarey.com and it was about selling recordings. So the trademark office is going to look at that and go, okay, is this confusingly similar to a trademark that already exists, presumably the one that Mariah Carey had. And they have experts who look at it and 
people who come and testify in court and say, yeah, it is confusingly similar. If people saw Mary Carey, they might actually think it's Mariah Carey. And then they would be, again, using air quotes, tricked into thinking it was that person when it wasn't that person. So she's taking advantage that it's similar. Yeah, exactly. They're like doing it on purpose to, to play off of someone else's fame to try to get mm -hmm. some of those people. So that's presumably why she uh, Mariah Carey won that particular thing. So finally, with your unique perspective as a branding expert, what are some of the things that you would advise parents on in choosing baby names? People should do research to make sure that it doesn't, if you're making a name up, if you're coining something, that it isn't a real word in some other language, um, that it's not going to mean something bad. You know, don't be racist and don't appropriate a name from another culture for sure. And maybe look at the naming trends to see where you're comfortable. Some parents do want to give their child a name that will really make them fit in, right? So they don't care if the 26 other kids in, in fourth grade are named Jack. They want their kid to be a Jack too because it's common and they'll fit in and now they have a peer group. Some parents don't want that, so it's a choice. But you, you need to just think about what life is going to be like for your kid and also to accept the fact that your kid might change their name and there's kind of nothing you can do about that after they reach a certain age. Well, Laurel, thank you again for joining us today. How can people find you online? They can find me at suttonstrategy.com where I have a, a blog where I talk about things. Um, also at Catchword Branding where I still do some work. And if you're interested in all things naming, I encourage you to check out the American Name Society at americannamesociety.org. So that was really interesting mm. that Laurel had all that information about like both the legal part of naming and how we tend to name our children after products, but those were named after people in the first place. So that's kind of cool. Yeah, I agree. I think it was really funny what she said about Nova because I always believed it was real. I know. <laughs> Dad told us that that was a real story, so I believed it. And I think we even mentioned it in a past podcast as being real. <laughs> I think so too. Yeah, name myth. We're wrong. Culpa mia. Or Mia Culpa. <laughs> you can make Mia responsible for that, whoever Mia is. <laughs> anyway, so I thought it was interesting what she had to say about pronunciability and spelling. But that's very controversial right now because pronunciability and spelling well, it's cultural. It is cultural, exactly. Because, you know, a name that is pronounceable in one language might not be pronounceable or might trip up a speaker of another language. And I think that's why it's become controversial. Like when you say easy to spell, easy to pronounce, like in whose culture? Exactly. Not only the dominant culture. Yeah, it's like people who write me and say, you know, you have ridiculous names on your site and these are names I would never name my baby. It's because we have an ethnically diverse database. These are names you're just not exposed to, you know, in your culture. And that doesn't make them ridiculous, you know. <laughs> and that's from the woman who suggests Prex Dickity. Oh, <laughs> Still a cool name. <laughs> um, I also thought it was interesting about like trademarking a name because I've had people write us to remove a name from the database because they didn't want anyone else to have the same name as their child. But unfortunately, you can't protect a personal name unless it's also a brand name like Cher or Marilyn Monroe, where they get the copyright protection on the brand doing business. And I also like what she had to say about knowing the meaning, but that, of course, comes from Mallory, whose name means unlucky duck, right, Jennifer? And we're going to talk about that a little later <laughs> in the episode. All right. Well, what time is it now? And now it's time for Celebrity Baby News. <laughs> While actress Eliza Dushku and her husband, Peter Palangian, are expecting their first child together... Peter is a real estate mogul and former professional tennis player and father to four children from a previous relationship. 
Richard Gere, 69, and his wife, Alejandra Silva, 35, welcomed their first child together, a baby boy named Alexander, apparently after mama. Richard has a 19-year-old son, Homer, with ex-wife, Carrie Lowell, and Alejandra has a six-year-old son, Albert, from a previous marriage. Now, The Simpsons debuted in 1989. I looked it up. So that's 30 years ago. So who would name their son Homer? I don't know. It must have been a family name or maybe he admired the ancient philosopher or something. UFC rising star Mackenzie Dern just revealed she's expecting. The 25-year-old says she'll put her career on hold until she has the baby. Well, I hope so. (laughs) That would be really awful if she was fighting. Um, Dern is dating Brazilian pro surfer Wesley Santos. Serbia's first gay prime minister, Anna Brnabic, announced the birth of her first child. The office of the prime minister announced that Anna's partner, Milika Djurjic, gave birth to a baby boy and they named him, wait for it, Igor. Oy. In 2017, Anna became Serbia's first LGBTQ head of state, a surprising move in a country that still doesn't legally recognize same-sex marriage. So anyway, what do you think about that name, Igor, Mal? Well, to be technical, Igor is of Slavic origin, meaning warrior. Now to be more like Mallory. I am not ever going to suggest that a baby be named Igor. It just brings to mind a henchman to Frankenstein or Dracula or whoever that monster was in the movies. Okay. I think you brought up a good point, though, that here in the U.S., we have a public association with the old sidekick henchman from the monster movies. And that's a very strong association. So I believe that's why Igor has not been a popular name in the United States. However, It is in the more Slavic countries. Absolutely. For more celebrity baby news, go to babynames.com and click Celebrities in the Menu. And now in our final segment, it's letters from you, our listeners. All right. Well, this is my favorite letter ever. Yeah. Dear Mallory and Jennifer, I'm a Mallory too. And I can relate to Mallory's stories about having a unique name because I was born in 1980, two years before the TV show Family Ties made it popular. So let's talk about this meaning. Does it really mean unfortunate or unlucky? I've heard of Sir Edmund Mallory. Did it have a different meaning as a surname? I'm dying to know. Love the show and keep up the good work. I binged on every episode and I'm now caught up. Sincerely, Mallory G. Ooh, well, I think she was referring to George Mallory, who was an English mountain climber who died in 1924 trying to ascend Mount Everest. Not to be confused with Sir Edmund Hillary, a New Zealand mountaineer who was the first climber to actually make it to the summit of Everest in 1953. Poor George Mallory. Yeah, they didn't even find his body until 1999. Anywho, back to our wonderful name, Mallory. For first names, yes, Mallory might have come from the Norman French with the same root as the French word malheur, meaning sad or unfortunate, I think, because malheureusement is unfortunate. It could also come from Mallory in Latin from malus orugus or bad omen. Wow. So sad. The name first hit the charts in 1983 after Family Ties debuted in 1982. The highest it's been on the U.S. charts is 83 in 1986. For 2017, it ranked number 551. I'm thinking we need to bring this name back into style, folks. Well, I think maybe it's now considered a little dated, just like Jennifer. Wah, wah. I disagree. Forget the meaning. Mallories are mighty. Mallories are magnificent. I'm starting a Mallory revolution. Okay, you do that. Hey, listeners, if you are a Mallory out there, 
write us and let us know how you feel about your name. Absolutely. And I do remember someone playing a joke on me when Baby Names first got published online. And she decided to publish the meaning of Mallory as unlucky duck because of Mallard. And I didn't notice this for about a year. And then I decided to look up. I wonder what Jennifer has for the meaning Mallory. And I'm like, unlucky duck. What? And I made her change it. Yes. Yeah, I did that as a joke. And plus, you guys, we do have some seeded names in our database that are not real names and have kind of funny meanings. And the reason why we do that is so we can track if other sites steal our content. Yes, absolutely. And so I'm not going to tell you what they are, but if you do run across kind of a crazy name with a funny meaning, that might be the case. But it also can set new trends because you never know if you yeah, never know to use these names as your baby names. Okay, I'll say one, Pookie. <laughs> Pookie. So if you decide to use Pookie as a baby name, that's no worse than Praxicity Dickity Doo. What about Caractacus Pots? Caractacus Pots, right? I love that name too. Maybe it's just my name preference. I like long Greek sounding names. You and your TV shows. Well, I'm getting exposed to a lot of different cultures. I think that's a good thing. So goodbye, everybody. We love you. We do love you. And we love our sisters, Sue and Kate. Sue and Kate. Did you see Kate went back to doing her stained glass? And it's just absolutely beautiful. It's so exciting to see her doing well. For those of you who don't know, she is battling pancreatic cancer. The doctor gave her six months to live and she's over a year. So she is fighting her hardest. And she's a strong woman, and we're all rooting for her. We love you, Kate. We do, we do, we do. So goodbye, folks. Until next time, and don't forget to subscribe to the Baby Names Podcast so you don't miss an episode. Bye.